To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But you know what? This is a, a word that we do not want to happen in our lives. But the reality is we open compromise. At work, in school, even in relationships and in many other things. We compromise when it is convenient, when the situation demands it, when everybody else is doing it, even though you know it's wrong, and when there's pressure on us. Many of us compromise. We will be continuing in our series of our conversations on the letter uh, to the churches, the seven churches in the Asia Minor, in the book of Revelations, and our conversation today will be the fourth letter to the church of Thyatira. Thyatira, how do you pronounce it? Thyatira or Thyatira? Uh, some said Thyatira, but some said Thyatira. I, I googled it, and uh, the go Google tells me it's Thyatira. So I'll just stick to that, <laughs> to that uh, pronunciation, Thyatira. The theme of the letter to Thyatira uh, is about compromise. The church of Thyatira did not have the same persecution as in the church of Smyrna. We heard it two weeks ago that the church of Smyrna suffered great persecution. They were thrown into the uh, amphitheater to be eaten by the lions. They became spectators at the time. The church of Thyatira do not have that kind of persecution. They did not... Uh, experienced that kind of persecution. In fact, the church of Thyatira were enduring in their love, in their service, in their faith. They are improving in all these things. But the sad thing is they still fail in the eyes of God because they have permitted, permitted someone, some teachings, some false teachings to enter into the church. And so, this is the theme of, of our conversation today. I would like to title it, it's a failure by permission. Because the church of Thyatira permitted certain person to introduce false teachings into the church. Before we proceed, before we go on, I'd like to quote uh, a saying quoted by Martin Luther King Jr. I think most of you would know him. He said that the ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Do you agree? Later on, we will look into it and how is it related to what we are discussing now. The letter of Thyatira was written many, many years ago to these people, but it is also applicable to us now. It is very much applicable to every church that is uh, in, in the, at this time. And it is my hope that... Uh, we can bring home this message for all of us that agreement with the world brings disapproval from God. Let's go back in history. Let's just give you a little bit background of what we are talking about, the church of Thyatira. 
As we all know, this is part of the seven churches that is mentioned in the book of Revelation, starting with Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamon, and now we are at Thyatira. It is uh, at the town at the western side of what is known now as Turkey. Current name now is Akisar, not no longer Thyatira, but Akisar. It was destroyed during one of those wars that uh, at the time, and if you will visit Turkey, I hope we can visit Turkey one of these days, but the, the thing is, you can only see rocks among, among all these things. There are peculiar things about the Thyatira Church or the Thyatira, the, the, the city itself. First of all, um, the Roman guards, the elite Roman guards were stationed at Thyatira. Not because they want to protect the city. They stationed the guards there so that it will delay any invading forces to come to Pergamum, who was a more important city, as we have learned last Sunday, that Pergamon uh, is a place, the place where the royal house was there, is the seat of authority, the, uh, the officers, the officials of the government are there. So it's just a decoy for, for them to put the garrison there. It's, it's just only to delay any invading forces to go to Pergamum. Another peculiar thing about Thyatira is these guilds, trade guilds. It's like the labor unions today. So they have these trade guilds, carpenters, the guild, uh, tanners guilds, uh, masonry guilds, and good sellers, weavers, tent makers. They're all there. And if you will remember Lydia, she was the one of the first converts of uh, Paul in his second missionary journey. Uh, she came from Thyatira as she was selling purple linen. If you remember in the book of Acts chapter 16, Thyatira had become pr prosperous and they had become a hub for commercial, for uh, manufacturing because of these guilds. However, to be able to learn, take note of this, uh, because this will form some of the basis of our discussion, our conversation today, that to be able to learn, to, uh, to earn a decent living in that place at that time, everyone, every trade must be a member of a guild. If you're a carpenter, you have to be a member of a carpenter's guild, and so on and so on. But the problem is these guilds not only form an organization, they were linked with the worship of other gods. They were linked. Every guild will have uh, its particular guardian. And as a member, you will be expected to participate in their practices. You are, as a member, you are expected to comply with their rules and regulation, with their constitution and bylaws. And that included offerings to these gods and even immoral things, immoral practices, sexual immorality, sexual behaviors. That is why the, the church, the people of Thyatira Church has this dilemma. I want to make a living, but I want to stay faithful to Christ. I need to join the guild in order to make a living. This is the dilemma that they were at na at the time. They were turned to making, between making a living on the one hand, which meant having to be part of the guilds, and on the other hand, staying faithful to Christ and his standards. Put yourselves into the people of Thyatira at that time. I have a family to feed, but the problem is I cannot earn a decent living because I do not want to participate. They want to be a member of any guild because they are participating, they are practicing the worship of other gods. So this is where the people of Thyatira at the time, this is their situation. Now let's go to the letter. Let's look at the letter verse by verse. In the first verse, 18, he said, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message of the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. Did you know that this is the only praise, this is the only time that the word, that the title Son of God was given to Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Nowhere, that, nowhere else in the book of Revelation that you can find the title given to Christ except for the letter to Thyatira. Of course, in the gospel, the Son of God is given to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ many times in all the gospel. But here, it's because it speaks of authority. It speaks of stressing 
Jesus stressing his authority over the Thyatira, over the gods of the guilds. The, the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ was described as eyes like the flames of fire, feet are like polished bronze. If we can um, ascribe literally these words to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's come sometimes a bit scary, you know? How can he, he has a, a eyes that like flames of fire and feet like polished bronze? In all the seven churches, in all the letters to the seven churches to the, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the only place that his appearance was described. It reminds us that God's eyes are penetrating, seeing everything, knowing everything. Nothing is hidden from God. This a metaphor that is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Nothing is hidden from God. This is the, the metaphor that the word, the, the flames of fire uh, being said here. The flame signifies anger also to what his people are doing and feet like polished bronze. At the time, bronze was the hardest metal that uh, known to that at the time. And it's often used to speak judgment. Christ was preparing for judgment for the people of Thyatira, in particular, the church of Thyatira. 19A, this is one of the best part of the, of the letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church in Thyatira. I know all the things that you do. This verse can be both assuring and uncomfortable. Assuring because God knows what is happening in our lives, good or bad. We know that God feels what we feel and He cares for us. Even though sometimes we don't feel it. But this is this word. In Psalm chapter 139 verses 1 to 4, it was David who was saying this, O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You can just imagine God looking at us every step of the way. God is concerned. It is a very assuring, reassuring words from the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, as I said earlier, this is also uncomfortable. Because again, in Psalm 139, David said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the furthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. Everything that we are doing is not a secret to God. He knows everything or you feel uncomfortable. I would rather choose the assuring part because whatever comes my way, I know that God is with me. I know that God is for me. Amen. 19b, I have seen your love, uh, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. What a church. What a church. They are increasing in their love, in their faith, and service, and endurance. In the first letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to the first church, it says, you have, you have forgotten your first love. Your love has turned cold. But here in Thyatira, they are progressing. They are improving in their love. Faith is also evident in the church. They are improving all these things. The service in the church and community. I can imagine that their events, uh, probably concerts, are, are getting bigger and better every time. I can just uh, not help but uh, compare our church now to the church of Thyatira, I can say that we are, we have come a long way. We have progressed. We are improving. We want to do better for God every time. But individually, are you growing also in love, in your faith, in service, in endurance? Are you growing also in all these things? I hope we are. hope we are all growing into this, 
and all these things. 19b is what the Lord Jesus Christ, the commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church of Thyatira. But 20 verse 8 said, but I have this complaint against you. I can imagine the church, the members of Thyatira would have that verse in, in 20a, in 19b, stop there and not move on to this verse 20a. I have this complaint against you. But that is God because He loves each one of us. He does not only praise us, but He also rebuke us sometimes, scold us when we are not going according to His ways. I have this complaint against you. What are these complaints? You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She, she, she teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. This is the complaint of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church of Thyatira. In Pergamon, we also hear that they were compromising, but there was nothing, no one mentioned uh, in that church who was instigating it? But in Thyatira, there is one person, a very influential person, who implements the church to compromise. Who is this Jezebel? Let me just give you a little background of who is this Jezebel. Most probably, it's not her real name, but it, the, the writer or John was alluding, and the Lord Jesus Christ was alluding to Jezebel of the old times. In, Je in 1 Kings chapter 17, she was... A woman, a queen of Israel at the time, Elijah was a prophet. You know Elijah, right? She was a wicked woman married to Ahab, the king of uh, Israel. When she, and when she became king, she turned first the heart of her husband, then the heart of Israel to the worship of Baal. This is a, a false god, a god that is not existing, the god that does not hear, that does not talk, that, does not, that cannot move, that cannot protect itself. It's worthless, but this woman enticed and influenced the people at the time, not only, the, not only her husband, but also the people of Israel. His, her official act as recorded in scripture, scripture was to kill the prophets of the Lord. Her ways were blatantly against God. She did away with God's spiritual leaders and replaced them with the prophets of Baal. If you remember the, the confrontation, the duel at, the, at, the, at Mount Carmel with Elijah, yeah? I will not talk about that. It's quite a long story. You, you can read it in 1 Kings chapter 17. At Thyatira, she was probably very influential, leading Jesus' servants astray. But you know, the name of Jezebel here is probably an insulting name. It's not a real name. As he, he was just alluded uh, uh, of Jezebel of 1 Kings 17. And Jezebel, she claimed to be a prophet, as we have learned in the scripture, receiving who are prophets. They are people who receive special instructions from God. She misled the people. She's saying that it is okay to join the guild and participate in their feast. I heard it from God. God is telling each one of us, it's okay. You can join them. Anyway, it's only during the meeting that you will participate in their feasts, in their idol offering, in their, in their immoral acts there. Once a month lang naman. Probably he, she's saying that. Everybody is doing it. It's okay. God will understand. Anyway, we live by grace and there's no more condemnation. Kinote pa yung ano, yung salita ng Panginoon Diyos. She would probably be saying all these things. You know, material things are... Blessings from God, even sex, according to what she may be implying here. It's okay to join that guild. It's okay to participate in their, in their celebration, in their feast. We are very familiar with fiesta, right? Who doesn't know fiesta? Is it okay for us Christians who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, who know the word of God, to participate in a fiesta. It's nothing wrong. It's fun. But I have a problem with that because celebrating in a fiesta is like participating in idolatry. You are one with them if you participate in those kind of gatherings. Look at the picture. This is just a very uh, uh, a classic example of people giving, giving 
prominence, why do I say that it is not right for us to participate in such? Look, go back to the Word of God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 to 4, it says, The Lord God says, you must, not, you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them. Or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. God did not say your worship for any other God. He said your affection. When you give affection to anyone, to anything, God is jealous because he doesn't want to share his glory with anyone. Let us be careful on those things. It's not me who's saying this, but it is the word of God who's saying this. Let us be careful. Agreement with the world brings disapproval from God. You may think it is harmless. You may think it's fun, but the Lord God is grieving. The church of the Thyatira earned the disapproval of God because of two things. Take note of this. As we have been saying, because of the guilds, they were pressured from joining one of, one of the guilds because they have to make a, they earn a living. Pressures from outside, but there are also pressures from inside. They were, they earned the disapproval of God because of the deception within the church. People today are still being deceived. It's a lesson for all of us also that even though we have the book of the Bible, if we are not if we are not diligent in the study of this word, we will be deceived also. One preacher even said that believe, believe that blessings will come to you suddenly, unexpectedly, out of the ordinary. This is the thing that they have been hearing and people are believing. Sure enough, God is able and can provide the luxuries that we need. Even the things, the luxuries that we want because He is a God that is gracious. But we need to go back also to the Word of God because the blessing from God, as we, have, we can read in the Bible, is almost always with conditions. The only blessing from God that we will say is free is the salvation that He is offering to, each, to anyone. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoso, who, whosoever believe in his son will not perish but have eternal life. But in other blessings, it's almost always come with a condition. In Joshua 1.8, it says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword. It can cut through us, through our beliefs, through the things that we know ever since when we were young. But this is the Word that will free us. This is the Word that will liberate us from the bondage of this world. This is the Lord God speaking to Jezebel. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. This is a very, a very uh, gracious word from the Lord Jesus Christ. I gave her time to repent. Jezebel was against God, blatantly against God. That's why God is giving, just gave Jezebel time to repent. But the sad thing is, she doesn't want to turn away from her immorality. God is our God of many chances, mga kapatid. Whatever you have done in life, Whatever you are doing, just go back to God. In 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is our God, mga kapatid, that there is nothing in this world, that there is no one in this world that He cannot forgive. If we will just confess our sins to Him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our wickedness. This is our God that He is there always to forgive you. He is there always to love you, to love all of us. 
in verse 22, Therefore, because Jezebel will not repent of, his, of her immorality, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her suffer, will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from their evil deeds. A bed of suffering can be sickness. We don't know. But this is what God will do to those who will not repent. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Children here may not necessarily mean the biological children of Jezebel, but those people, those members of the church who have believed in her lies, who have believed in her prophecy, the followers of Jezebel, God is loving and merciful, but he, but he is also our just God. Verse 24, but I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed these false teachings, deeper truths, they call them depths of Satan actually. Praise God. Because the church of Thyatira, some members of the church of Thyatira did not believe the message of Jezebel. They call it deeper truths that God is merciful. God understands. Truly, God understands but there are bounds, there are limits, there are boundaries to what we can do. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. What is this holding tightly? To what? It is the truth of God that there is only one God. There is no other God in this world, but there is only one God. A God that is jealous, who will not share his glory with any other gods or images. Now you may be thinking, I am... I don't serve other gods. I don't have idols. I don't create images. I don't worship. I don't participate in all the things that, are, uh, that we, I've shown you earlier. But you know what? Anything can be your God other than God himself. The things that you're holding that you give more priority to rather than God. The promise now by God to all of us, the all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end. To them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Christian life, the Lord says, who obey me to the very end. Christian life is like a marathon. You know, the marathon that is not about sprinting. It's not about being fast. It's not about reaching there immediately. It's all about journeying in this life with God. It's all about journeying with God, enjoying life with God. And until we reach the end, the very end, where he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the most important thing for all of us, that we can hear the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of our race, at the end of this journey in this life, that God will say, well done, he will pat us on the back and say, good and faithful servant. Definitely we fall down. We fall down many times. I fall down many times. I sin many times. All of us sin many times. But the important thing is you get back up. Ask for forgiveness. And journey again with God. Walk again with God. Until such time that he will call you heavenward. Enjoy life with God. Go back up. Ask for forgiveness. And walk with God again. He will give us authority as well. It talks about the end times. Probably now we are not having authority into, uh, over many things. Over many people. Over many nations. Look at the, the things that are going around us. We may not have the authority now. People are dying. People are being uh, murdered because of our faith. But it talks about the end times. It talks about, this talks about when the Lord Jesus Christ will come, that he will be victorious with us as he will give us authority over these nations. This is the, this is the thing that we are hoping for, that we are looking forward to. They will receive, they will have the same authority as I receive from my father, and I will also give them the morning star. Who is this morning star? Or what is this morning star? As we go forward to the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ 
calls himself the morning star. It is Jesus Christ himself that is our reward. It is Jesus Christ himself that will be enough for us. In Christ alone, as we have sung earlier, in Christ alone, that we put our trust, that we have our meaning of life. And the last verse, the famous verse that is always present in all the seven letters to the churches, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Anyone who was here, lahat naman tayo may tenga. But what is, what is this saying to us? What is this saying to us? There are two things that we can do this, we can, that we can apply this. First is apply the message to others. Ah, this message is for him or for her, for my friend, for anyone, but not for me. And lose what the Spirit is telling you. Or apply it to yourself, mga kapatid, and receive the victory that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is saying here, so that you will not be tossed to and fro by the teachings of this world as well. The letter to Thyatira is applicable to us. It's timeless. It's applicable to them, na, to them then and to us now. Why do we compromise? Why do we compromise? When there is pressure in school, you will not be accepted if you don't join that kind of organization, the dance organization, the whatever kind of organization. Sometimes you are, you are pressured to join that kind of organization. I'm not saying they are bad, but you must be careful on what they practice. We are pressured at work that sometimes we prepare to work on a Sunday rather than come to church. Probably to avoid argument, we compromise. Though you know already that you are right, but because you don't want argument, okay, I'll just give in. Again, I like to bring back the words of Martin Luther King as we end here. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. Napakadali kasi. We are happy when it's convenient, when it's comfortable. But, the measure of man is where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. When there is challenge to our faith, when it is challenge to our social being, when there is controversy, when we are made to choose between God and man. That's the measure of man. I'd like to leave with you the word of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6. We are worrying people. We worry too much. But the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to each one of us, do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the, for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. God knows, as we have seen in His words, what you're going through. What are your problems in life? What are your needs? Even your desires. Nothing is hidden from God. And He cares for each one of us here. God knows. But this is what He is telling each one of us. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Put God first above all. And all these things, what are all these things? The things that we need, the things that we want, the things that we desire according to His will, will be given to us as well. This is the promise. Let's hold on to the promise of God, not to the teachings of any other people. God cares for each one of us. But this is the word, His word for all of us here. That we seek first, put God first as a priority that we may not fail by permitting other people to run our lives, to dictate what the Lord Jesus Christ has already told us. To dictate otherwise.